John Russin is here for his return appearance. And you don't know this, and I'm, I'm going to blow your ego up a little bit here. In 240 episodes of the Renegade Radio Podcast, yours is still top 10, son. Top 10? Yes. Top wow, that's 10. impressive, man. Yeah, I keep man. on getting emails and I keep on getting messages. People are listening, so they that's how we got it, in. I mean, how long has it been? Like two years now? It had to be at least two years, I think. I think almost two years, yeah. Okay. Luca hooked us up, and yeah. ever since, it's been history, man. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I am, this is my only my second podcast well, maybe not my second, that I'm completely unprepared for. <laughs> We're just going to wing it. We're just going to talk. So uh, let's just catch up what's been going on. That's why I purposely didn't ask you too much out there. I just want to catch up. Yeah, tell, me, tell me what's happening. So you're here in L.A. because... We got a two-day seminar going. Uh, we're doing it at Show Up Fitness Academy in West Hollywood, and we actually sold out that event. And it's the second event of the year, and we sold out the first one over at Onnit Academy in Austin, Texas, too. So... This year, 2018, has been fucking crazy on the travel schedule. Uh, I've been eight trips in, I think, uh, 11 weeks. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. And is, is the rest of the year going to be like that? Uh, the first eight months of the year, we're trying to chill the fuck out, like the last couple months. You know, okay. when it hits Thanksgiving and Christmas, yeah. we're trying to chill. But, um, yeah, everything's going really well to the point where opportunities are coming up, and we're kind of seizing them little by little. But that does have me traveling more because yeah. not a whole lot of opportunity is going on in Madison, Wisconsin. Sure. <laughs> so what else are you traveling for besides your own seminars? So uh, we hooked up with uh, Dave Tate as a client. So we're going into Columbus multiple times this year, uh, doing some training with him at Elite FTS. And we also are speaking at uh, five NSCA events this year. You okay. know, going in, nice. keep on going with the NSCA. Yeah. And then uh, more seminars. How man. does that work? How, how do you get in? How do you get hooked up with the NSCA? I got a call one day, like two years ago, and they're like, John, uh, you're, you've been a member for a long time. Do you want to actually come speak for us? Yeah. And I did. Nice. And one led to another. And I think it's like anything else. You do a good job, and then people want to continue to bring you sure. back. So we've been doing more and more. It started at a state clinic. We're doing regional events. Hopefully, we'll do some national events this year. Nice. And what about the Equinox thing? How long has that been going? Yeah, that's the other big thing that has me traveling. I didn't even mention that. So uh, I'm going to be doing eight different cities this year all around the world with Equinox. And that's going to oh, All around the world. Yeah. So wow, they, they, have, uh, they have London, they have up into Canada, and then they have U.S. So they have flagship spots all over the place and they yeah. bring in all the trainers from the regional places so this weekend i'm gonna do one in la nice. and i think it's like seven or eight different facilities all of their trx trainers are coming into the same one and running a four-hour education for them so now will you go all the way to london for just a four hour you'll i don't do know like if i'm gonna <laughs> make it to london man like for, yeah. yeah four hours yeah. No, i'm not that fucking good like yeah. that's for sure but um we done chicago so far we got la and miami on the books and then yeah. later on this year we got probably boston new york maybe up into canada again Wow. Now, who do, who do you bring with you? It's not just you when you do these, is it? It's just me oh, most of the time. Okay. Uh, so my wife is a uh, co-owner of multiple of our businesses. She runs the back end on things. So she's the event coordinators. She'll uh, do a lot with ticket sales, with customer service and okay. that. But when it's time to go out, man, it's, it's just me. It's yeah. me against the world. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it's so a what goes on at these weekends tell, tell me how it all goes down it's uh it's not as sexy as it would sound it's me literally talking for 18 to 20 hours over a two-day course Jeez. and uh, it's all of our system so it's a pain-free performance training system okay. so we go through screening processes evaluations advanced diagnostics if you are clinicians but then we go into the fht style training and how to actually put that blueprint into play so functional hypertrophy training has been something that's really been taking off for us in the last two to three years and now we've really just systemized it in a way that's way more usable for trainers and also uh even athletes to use and customize it themselves yeah is it only trainers that go or do you get some so we just get fitness 85 percent are going to be fitness professionals okay. we get about 10 percent that are clinicians so chiros pts people like that and then we get about five percent that are actually athletes okay but you know what like th those five percent of athletes that come in these people are fucking amazing they're into it yeah, yeah they're yeah, yeah. totally into yeah. it they're my favorite people every single time yeah nice so talk about uh the business growth over the last couple of years <laughs> It has been exponential, yeah. um, and it's definitely not been something that's been strategic. Mm. It, the best way I can explain it has been organic. Yeah. Um, four years ago, nobody knew who I was. Nobody right. knew my fucking name. I was coaching athletes 70 hours a week, uh, right. you know, 
just doing my work. Yeah. And then one article led to 10 articles, led to 100, led to a website, led to products, led to seminars. And it's all really spiraling pretty quick now, but it's all in a good direction because over these last couple of years, I've always been trying to be authentic with everything that we yeah. did. I was never trying to pretend or trying to uh, sell something above right. my means. It's always been something that's been value driven. And that's something that is still standing today, which I'm really proud of. But yeah. Uh, man, it's like two totally different careers because I was training and treating 100% of the time. And now we're really close to 100% of the time on the content ed education side of mm. things. And it's still in the fitness industry, but it might as well be two totally different business endeavors. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, right now we have four different businesses under one big umbrella. What are the four? So we have a consulting business. <clears throat> we have our e-commerce platform. Uh, we have my educational platform, and then we also have uh, the gym and the physical therapy center in Madison, okay. Wisconsin. Wow. That's a lot going on. <laughs> it's a lot of books for my wife. You know, yeah. she's the financial <laughs> yeah. guru, so yeah. she has a lot to do every month. Yeah. <laughs> now, are, were there any things that, that stood out to you as, wow, this was a real game changer? I mean, aside, obviously, from appearing on here, that was the number one highlight of your career. <laughs> <laughs> that was the big break. Yeah, yeah. Luca gave me that big break, man. <laughs> that email was game changer. I mean, honestly, the, there's been two really big game changers in my career, uh, and they're both very different from one another. My first one uh, was actually the death of my father. Mm. So I had a great job out in Southern California. I lived in a beautiful building on the water, just like this building we're sitting in right now. I was training pro athletes, doing great things, loving life. And uh, my dad got hit with a terminal diagnosis with esophageal cancer. Wow. So he had four months to live. And he was in New York with my mom at the time. So you know what? I packed up and I went in and I took care of him. Mm. Took care of my mom and we got things settled. Like literally I left a dream job to go and do that. Right. And at that point, you know, I had I had some pretty good credentials in my career. You know, I've been a division one strength coach. I've worked with thousands of athletes at that time, some of the best in the world. I didn't know what the fuck I was gonna do. Literally, I had no idea. I sat for in Buffalo, New York for about four to five weeks and I was just like, you know what? Uh, uh, should I go back to California? What should I do next? What should mm. I do next? And you know, I got to spend a lot. And how old were you at the time? This is uh, this is five years ago. Oh, jeez, wow. Okay. This is five years ago, and uh, you know, at that point in time, I it's didn't so know cool what was to hear next, that. Man. I mean, I don't even know the rest of the story, but it's so <laughs> cool to hear, you know, like five years ago that you were struggling with that, and look what's going on now. So it gives hope to anybody listening. It's awesome. So what well, is? Um, it, it put things in perspective. So yeah. my dad was a guy, he was an athletic director for 27 schools in the greater New York area. So he had a really a lot of influence on kindergartners all the way up to seniors in high school and their athletic development, their health education. Mm. And he had this for 30 plus years. Yeah. So, you know, as he was, um, so was, you know, was he the one that got you into fitness? And for sure. Yeah. yeah. He was definitely the spark plug. You know, I was in a gym since I've been pretty much born you know yeah. I was going to basketball games football games I was doing everything with the kids in the high school but we had a lot of really good time together at the end and he really wanted me to just like you know what John you know follow your fucking passion you know do what you love to do yeah. and he was always the guy you know, like you want to move to California you want to make $19 an hour and take a job and not pay for anything yeah. like go do it like not be able to pay for anything go do it right and at that point you know i was like you know what i think i might be doing something a little bit differently because i had some influences in the fitness uh side of things that were doing some really awesome things they were touring the world they're going and speaking they were running seminars they're doing all this awesome stuff and i, I never thought i was going to do something like that but when he passed you know i was like what's next and actually after he passed that's when i started the first website so the first huh. drjohnrussin.com went up a couple weeks later. Wow. Yeah. And we had the first article. I, I, it's not on the site anymore. I wish it was. But it was um, 60 things that uh, my dad taught me. Huh. That was the first article that ever aired on a drjohnrussin.com. So since that point, you know, I made a couple different decisions to go a little bit more away from pro sport. I've been in and out of it a little bit, yeah. but really led to uh, more of just the general fitness population. And then more specifically, really niching off into the hardcore strength and performance athlete. Right. So that's really kind of where we sit right now. But that was really the spark plug to kind of get that, hey, this is what I want to do. I, I fucking did it and yeah. it, it was hard, but it was like, I was an emotional train wreck at the time, you know, sure. trying to hold my mom together. Her husband just died. You know, I'm an only child, so I don't have any brothers and sisters to hold yeah. down the fort. So a lot of different stuff going on, but it almost gave me clarity at right. that point. 
and it was really easy to make hard decisions. Mm. The kind of decisions where nobody in their fucking right mind would make. You know, from a monetary standpoint, it's yeah. just like giving up your life, it almost seems like. Yeah. But looking back at it five years later, like it was a pretty good fucking move. Yeah. Um, but man, that second one, it's totally different because I mean, that's very grim story. It's yeah. like my dad fucking dies of cancer, family's falling apart, I have to go put the pieces back together, yeah. make a decision to go out and start doing some education. Next story. But wait, before we get yeah. to the second one, when the site goes up, when do you, you know, what are the first few months like? Are you second <laughs> guessing? Are you making any any kind of headwear? Is just like fuck? What you know? Uh, I didn't do it for anyone except for myself, so it was almost yeah. like a form of therapy at that okay. at point. Um, so I didn't really write a whole lot about the X's and O's, which I write about now. Yeah, it was more about um, just personal development, uh, the way that I was seeing things. Um, okay. And I did it every single week. I had an article okay. every week. You know, it was something regular. And I remember looking at the anal- I didn't look at the analytics. It was like a ticker on the website at the time. It had like 24 views <laughs> and like 12 of them with me. Yeah. <laughs> right. So literally nobody's reading this stuff. I yeah. wasn't like, hmm, strategically, I'm going to build this thing up yeah. and it's going to get a gazillion hits by the time 2018 rolls around. That was never in the cards. Yeah. But it was something that I was able to really put my thoughts down. The things that I've done, like the back of my hand in the gym with my athletes for years at a time, I was able to put those thoughts down and it spiraled over time because it gave me a little bit of practice in something that I was really shitty at, which was writing. Yeah. Like, not a good writer okay uh now i'm a good content producer but in terms of writing like if i went into an ap english class Mm in uh 12th grade like i would have failed that shit (laughs) so and then what was the the second one you were gonna mention so the second one um a little bit more bright would be uh the the when I found out my wife was pregnant with uh cameron who's our two and a half year old now so this is again you know like three 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 and a half years ago yeah and at that point, you know, I was running a uh, training business, running physical therapy business. You know, I've worked with really great people. We had, we were, we're starting to do things the right way, but I was like, holy fuck, like this kid's coming. I need to do something. Like I need to do something big. And then I ended up taking a contract to work in China for their Olympic committee. Really? Literally like I heard my wife was pregnant and I was like, I gotta do something. I gotta do something. It was almost one of those things I was like, <gasps> It's about to get real. Yeah. Like, I got to go do something to try to really make a stamp, make a name, and really do something influential, like, on the big stage. So, yeah. I ended up shipping out to fucking China. That's crazy. For months at a time. Wow. Yeah. Away yeah. from the family. Yeah. Away from everything. And it sucked. It yeah. was brutal. The work was amazing, though, because okay. I got to get in front of gold medalists, help them do what they needed to do. Mm. But also, uh, I had a little bit more introspective of what I was doing because it wasn't like, hey, I was dad. I was literally coaching or I was working on business stuff. Yeah. So even in China, over like, um, over like fake internet over there, still c- producing content, still doing things along the lines of that. And it was still all back end work because again, mm. nobody knew who I was back then, yeah. but I was kind of just getting all this stuff ready. And actually with the money that I made over there, I was able to revamp our website and make it actually a legitimate thing. Okay. Um, but it was crazy. But as soon as I knew that little guy was coming, yeah, <laughs> it was like a burner was under my fucking ass. Yeah. And that was the day that we started working seven days a week, okay. all night, all day. My wife works with us. So we really started crunching. And then when, when you were doing that, was there a point where things just really started taking off or was it kind of a slow growth? Um, it was, it's hard to say growth because, um, overnight we released one product that was successful, Okay. but about three or four years went into making that yeah. successful. You yeah. know, it's the, the peak of the iceberg, so to say. Yeah. And a lot of stuff was done that we weren't necessarily seeing dollar signs for, mm-hmm. you know, like when everyone was out at the bars on Friday and Saturday, like I was home writing articles, right. um, you know, Sundays, same thing. You know, we were running the seven day a week schedule and yeah. we really were grinding it pretty hard. Um, but that's something that people ask, like, where do you get time to write all these articles and be a dad and fly around the world and do all this shit? You make time because like what anyone else is not willing to do, that's what you should be doing. Totally. Uh, So that was really a thing that when I was out on a trip uh, launching FHT, that was the first sign of being like, holy shit, this is for real. Mm. Um, The launch of FHT, you know, years and years and years of work coming into fruition and literally like a week of a launch. That was when we actually knew that we had something pretty special with it. Yeah. So 
talk to me about you know what the business looks like now like how many people do you have working for you or do you have outsourced stuff to yeah so uh we have three full-time okay uh, we have myself all the content all the social media any article that you see i don't have those things ghost written it's yep. all me uh, the back end side of things, the financial and the business structure is all my wife. Okay. And then we have a full time guy that works on the back end of our site. Okay. So he puts together images, videos, he manages the site back end, uh, does a really good job. And then we do a little bit on the outsourcing. Uh, so we bring in some creative people for outsourcing. Does he them. create any like social media stuff or? I do every single thing. Okay. Yeah. So anything that comes out to the public, uh, anything that's actually content driven is all me. Okay. But um, yeah, we, we hire, uh, you know, we've worked with a couple people in the past to put some funnels together and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I know nothing about the marketing side yeah. of things. So really marketing is the only thing that we've been hiring out, but, uh, we keep it pretty lean right now and it's been working extraordinarily well because we're still to the point where we're growing at a pretty great rate Yeah, and it's not like we're out of time. We're right. not sacrificing anything quite yet, but okay. it's close to that point. Yeah. And what do you see? Like, what's the next big thing? Are you just kind of happy with the way things are going, the way things are growing? I, I never seek out any anything. It's uh, it's always opportunities present themselves. You always move in a path that you think is the right direction. Sure. But I think that opportunities actually bring you down the street to your destination. So this year, you know, with the Dave Tate, the Fixing the Dave Tate mm -hmm. project, that thing's been going viral over on Elite FTS. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be going on all year long. Yeah. Uh, every two to three weeks, we're going to be releasing segments. And it's unbelievable because I'm not only proud to put my process on video for everyone to watch, yeah. but I know that by people watching it, they're going to get a huge education. Yeah. They're going to see what we do, the way that we structure it, the way that we train somebody, even when they are in pain. And it's going to be a game changer, I think, for the industry, just because it does get out there to enough people where it's going to make a big market impact. Right. And then the second thing, um, not a whole lot of people know about this yet, but we actually partnered with bodybuilding.com. So they're going to be an exclusive provider of a lot of our content uh, going into Dude, 2018 awesome. yeah. and in the future. So uh, about midsummer, you'll see a brand new project from us uh, in partnership with bodybuilding.com. It's called Unstoppable, the ultimate guide to training through pain. Nice. So that's going to be a huge release. We shot yeah. that last month in Boise, Idaho. Okay. Uh, ten person fucking production yeah, crew. Yeah, it's amazing. It was like Hollywood, but in Boise, Idaho, right. but with a bunch of meatheads around. Yeah. It it's going to be another one of those game changers. But that's more geared towards the end user. Kay. That's going to be geared towards the athlete, the person that is frustrated being in the gym, being banged up, and not being able to get results. Yeah. That's who that's geared for. Whereas the Dave Tate thing is really geared towards the really high end athlete or the professional trainer. Yeah. Now, so when and where did it happen that you kind of branched off from the traditional route of, you know, go in the gym, hit your big lifts heavy first, like, because you sequence things differently. I mean, you have a different approach. What I'm sure like you had probably the same start that we all have and mm -hmm. did a million different things like we all do. And then over time, how did you figure out like, hmm, I, I want to do things differently? So I had a really good upbringing. Uh, back to my dad. My dad was the kind of dude that he was like, John, you're 15 now. You're, uh, you're a sophomore in high school. It's time that you learn how to lift weights. And he wasn't like, here's the bench press, here's the curl, and here's the overhead press. He didn't yeah. do that. Okay. He had connections to the point where you know he was a public figure. So he brought me over to the University of Buffalo, and he introduced me to their head strength coach and all their assistant strength coaches. And they, he goes, this guy's going to sit in the corner. He's going to be here every Wednesday for three hours. You don't have to do anything with them. Just let them stand in the corner and watch you. So I literally did that. That's pretty awesome. That was really awesome. Yeah. So at the time, like um, they had amazing coaching staff over there, like unbelievable. Okay. Buddy Morris. Yeah. <laughs> like nice. Julia Leduski over at Elite oh, FTS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, these people were mentors of mine because what after an amazing a year, start. That's yeah. unbelievable yeah. start. Yeah. So after a year of just like viewing things, like I didn't even train. I just kind of watched the way things were going. Yeah. Uh, and one of the coaches like threw me a dowel and was like all right, we're going to actually learn how to move. Like the kind of coach that wasn't a fucking meathead. Yeah. The kind of coach was like, we're going to learn how to move first, and then we're going to learn how to train. Fast forward two years later, I was able to transfer all those skills back into my sport, which is baseball, and really take it to a high level there. But I really never had bad coaching, mm. which was a huge advantage. Right. And really with that side of sports performance, it was like ingrained in me. So we were doing very, very smart programming. 
it wasn't pure conjugate, but it was kind of like, it's what Buddy's known for. Yeah. You know, it's something that is uh, the athletic performance meets uh, West Side model. Right, totally. And it was great stuff because, because it was Buddy's eclectic. always taken like that safer kind of approach. Yeah. yeah. It's an eclectic view of training. And really going through that and then going into graduate school and getting even more knowledge base about preventative injuries and the way to actually train around pain and actually rehabilitate pain, it kind of took those two things together. And after um, continuing to coach throughout grad school, I was like, well, shit, I have this like huge knowledge base in what I've been doing, which is athletic performance. And I've sat through fucking grad school for close to four years now. Like yeah. I learned a lot of shit. Maybe you like synergize these two things together. And that's kind of the, the start of that approach, the pain-free training approach. Okay. Um, but at the time, we didn't think it was anything novel. Mm. It's just what I was around. Mm -hmm. you know, I was around amazing coaches and I was really lucky to have the opportunity to be educated. Yeah. And I thought everyone was like that. Right. And then when you get through and you start putting performance training models together and you get a good results with your clientele, you're like, hmm, maybe there's something to this. And it's always like the curse of uh, thinking that everyone knows what you right, know. Right. Because if you're around great people, I mean, that's a huge advantage of life to be around great people. You always want to be around people smarter than yourself. Yeah. But when you're always around that, you don't think anything else exists. Yeah. So they're, they're presented a huge opportunity there because people were doing things ass backwards the way that they were doing it in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And it's a new day and age in fitness, especially with the kind of orthopedic outrage that we're currently seeing with our injury rates and people just on extreme burnouts. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like uh, the opportunity presented where most people people are having trouble staying healthy. I just happen to have this knowledge base that kind of fixes a little bit of that problem and we've turned it into the model. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Why do most people have trouble staying healthy? Like some of the stuff we, we addressed in the previous uh, episode, but a lot of people won't have heard it and you probably learned some stuff since then. So <laughs> tell me about, you know, why in general, what are some big mistakes? Talk about programming. Well, I mean, I think it's more than just the programming. It's not just uh, it's not just people going in and not doing the right things in the gym. I think they start behind the eight ball before they even get mm. in. Uh, I mean, honestly, the sitting in our culture, right. the sedentaryism of our culture. When we think about just posturing and getting out of these poor daily positions, that really has people struggling before they even get into the gym, yeah. turning things that should be good for them into potentially injurious. But then we have this also this biopsychosocial model of training that we have to either go all or none. It's like we sit on the fucking couch and we eat Snickers mm -hmm. or we go in and we train four hours a day, two a days until we get hurt or we get burned out. Yeah. And that's what ends up happening. The shelf life of somebody in a big box gym is about six weeks. Yep. It's crazy. Six weeks is just enough to chronic injure yourself. Yeah. And it's just enough to burn yourself out to the point where, you know, your hormonal levels, your body's responses to training are just telling you that you're not fucking doing the right thing. Yeah. So that's where we're at with people. And, you know, that is a big problem. But for the people that I see specifically, they are people that have been training for a long time. And they're the kind of type A personalities that, you know what, I'm going to fucking train because I know I need to train, even if it's hurting me. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of people that I get. They have 10, 20 years under their belt. And what they used to have success with, it's not working anymore. Right. So they just need a little bit of a paradigm shift on the way that they view training, the way that they view their physicality. And that's really what some of these, I hate to say alternative uh, methods, yeah. because they're really not. Right. Um, I didn't invent anything by any means. We just kind of restructured it in a different way. And it's more of a mindset thing. Um, it's not all, all about progressive overload all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not only about getting strong or getting big. It's synergizing a little bit of everything, taking the best from everything and putting it into one single offering. Yep. So let, let, let's get into the, the system a little bit more. And well, talk about traditional programming. Like let's go through some, for example, a big four split where you start each day with a heavy lift, like an overhead press, a bench, a squat, a deadlift. Why do you not like that? Let's talk about progressive overload. So it's not that I don't like that. Uh, if you're ready for that kind of training, like 100%, you can go in, you can hit the squat, the bench, the deadlift, and the overhead press four days a week. You can use it as your key indicator lift. That's totally fine. But that's not a vast majority of people. 90% yeah. of the population, they can't tolerate that. Right. So you got to figure out 
of trying to peak yourself to the point where you can get in meaningful strength work. You just got to work a little bit harder to get there. Yeah. So people are coming in, whether they train in the morning, train in the afternoon. I think one of the things about that is it's simpler to kind of quantify your gains. Like, okay, I know I'm doing these four lists 52 weeks a year. Yep. But then you don't, you can't end up doing it 52 weeks a year because <laughs> six weeks in you're destroyed. Yeah. That, that's the old school, uh, deloading model. Yeah. It's right, like right. you train until you get hurt and that's yeah. just fucking stupid yeah but it's almost like people need to view uh training as you go up the mountain then you come back down by the yeah. time you leave the gym but many times uh we try to start at the apex of the mm -hmm. mountain with the big lifts when we really didn't earn the right to get there we do no warm-ups if we do do a warm-up is bullshit texting on the treadmill or your foam rolling and humping the ground for 30 minutes yeah that's not a warm-up being able to address your weaknesses in the warm-up while also preparing yourself to perform that is what you need to do in about a five to 10 minute period. So let's talk about that a little. Cause some guys do just waste that 45 minutes warming up and it's <laughs> shit. They're yeah. foam rolling and whatnot. It's yeah. what I like to call rehab purgatory. Mm. Somebody comes in, their fucking shoulders jacked, their lower backs cranked up and they go, Oh shit, I better foam roll and do all this stretching. By the time they know it, 45 minutes goes by. They have an hour in the gym. They didn't even lift that day. Right. It turns into rehab purgatory. They got the fucking shackles on their ankles and they can't do anything to get out of it yeah. because they're inherently afraid of actually lifting. Yep. So they gravitate towards the functional training guru bullshit. Mm. That's not a good place to be. And honestly, for the long term, it's not going to keep you any more healthy than if you were to go mash like uh, on a 5-3-1 program, like just going crazy against progressive overload. So there has to be a, a medium. Mm -hmm. There has to be an easy medium where you can get the most out of the least amount of investment. Okay. So it's like Pareto's principle, right? Yep. It's the essentialist training program. What is essential for me to break down weak links, strengthen them back up, and stay consistent? If you can do that and be highly motivated with your training, you're going to be very successful. And really with that kind of mentality, you're thinking about longevity and long-term gain. When we can take away a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week or even a month-to-month -month kind of mentality, and we can look at a year-to-decade mentality, you doing something fucking stupid in the gym on Monday that's going to hurt you until the next Monday doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. So if you can kind of back up your mindset and kind of give a little bit in each of the different uh, modalities of physicality, that's where people are going to have the best amount of success. I think like Charles Staley said it the best. He just wrote an awesome article for my site. And he said, like, when you're old as fuck, like, there's certain things that you need to be able to do. Yeah. <laughs> Charles isn't old as fuck. I shouldn't say that. He's like, he's most jack 57 year old I know. But he's he's struggled in the last two years or so with two different uh, physical traits. So he's struggled with his mobility. Okay. He's also struggled with his cardiovascular health. And if you think about it, it's like, hmm, every guy that loves training really struggles with mobility and their cardio. Yeah. So oh. these are two of the four things, the other ones being body composition and strength that people should really be focusing on. And if you can kind of uh, structure your program around gaining and then maintaining around all four of these primary physical traits, then you're always going to have a baseline to fall back on because uh, everyone's gonna have struggles in life. They're gonna have injuries, they're gonna have systemic health issues. Mm -hmm. When you don't have requisite levels of these baselines, it's really hard to get them back and it doesn't get any easier as you get older. Yeah. So let, let's go through like a, an example of a warm up before an upper body day or a pull day or something like that. What would be some essential things and what's a waste of time? This is, this is easy. Spend a minute or two foam rolling stretching, spend a minute or two on some sort of movement drill Spend a minute or two practicing the fucking movement that you're going to do that day. Okay. So that looks like if you're going to squat, practice the squat. You know, pull out the goblet squat. Like, yeah. take it for a ride. And just give yourself enough time to be present in your movement quality. If you can just do those three blocks, some mobility work, some corrective work, and then practice the fucking thing that's going to be the highest yielding factor. Okay. People are going to get in within six to eight minutes and get back to training. And they're going to yeah. be far more successful. But it's about lining up the goal as the goal. If the goal is a squat that day, you got to prepare for the squat. You know, you're not worried about uh, your forearm flexor. Uh, you're thinking about putting the first things first. And that's really defining the linchpin. What's the one thing that's holding you back? And if it's systemizing your training, that's an easy fix. If it's fixing your T-spine mobility, that's an easy fix. But people, they try to do everything all at once. 
they get in, they go, holy shit, this foam rolling thing really worked for my calf. Like I'm gonna do my shoulder, my back, my yeah. hip, and all of a sudden, 45 minutes later, you're gone. Yeah. So we really just need to put first things first, and just know that we can't we can't do everything all at once. We need to put the most important thing first, and actually get a result with it. Once we get a result with it, it's far easier to maintain. And then the maintenance process becomes your training. People think that when they go into this pain-free performance training model that it's like, holy shit, I'm not going to be able to lift anymore and I'm just going to be doing foam rolling. That's not the case at all. Mm. Minimal effective doses on all the fluffy bullshit and we're trying to get the maximal amount of result out of the big factors, which I truly believe are the big compound lifts that are trained for hypertrophy and strength. So a after the warm up, you, you talk about primer movements. Mm -hmm. So you normally, I mean, I, I could be making an assumption that's incorrect, but you normally won't start with like a heavy squat or a heavy bench press. You'll do some kind of primer movement or something before, correct? Yeah. So if we don't use a primer movement, we're going to have an extended warm up of some uh, some sort. Okay. But the primer movement is key because you put in the first loaded movement pattern of the day. And it's something that is not going to be loaded super hard, super heavy, and it's not going to be something that's going to break you down. We're going to place an emphasis on the backside of the body because like, fuck, we need more emphasis there because nobody trains it. Yeah. And we're all in postural stresses all day long. We're trying to really gain some better stability, especially through the hips, through the backside of the shoulder. And we're just going to try to train the pump because nobody ever got worse from having a bigger ass, a stronger ass, yeah. or a fucking thick upper back. Right. So putting a lot of emphasis on that stuff, it's like put first things first. First things first is to build those spots up so you can actually go in and train more successfully with them. There's a lot of deep science on this too, but really what it gets down to is like priming the pump. Yeah. Priming the pump so you can go in and actually get more out of your big strength work if that is, again, your goal. But really, it's like the old school model of like, hey, we got to lift first thing, squat with the bar on your back, we got to pull from the floor, or we got to bench press. Yeah. And it's not true. You know, there's many different ways that we can train all these movement patterns. And when we kind of take away the emotional relationship and the dogma, which is old school strength and conditioning, mm -hmm. we can put in actual intelligent strength and conditioning, right. meaning that we define the goal and we find the most effective way to get towards the goal. And that's usually not benching first. Yeah. And then what do you say to guys who are like, oh, man, my bench is going to go way down or my squat's going to go way down if I do it second or third? I'm in a position where I've seen literally tens of thousands of people do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Their first phase of training, they go, oh, fuck, my bench, mm -hmm. my 5RM's down. Yeah. Second phase of training, my 5RM's up. Third training, their 1RM peak number PR. Yeah. So I see it over and over again, but it's usually the buy-in factor. Yeah. Um, nobody's going to change anything. Everything's fucking going good. Right. Like if everything is amazing, why would you ever change what you're doing? Mm -hmm. So it's usually the people that are hitting plateaus, they're struggling with nagging pain. Those are the ones that are willing to try out some new shit. Yep. Like the crazy new shit is usually the stuff that people need, as long as it's not too crazy. Yeah. And then, so what are other components that you think are important in keeping people healthy? Uh, maybe rotation of exercises. Cause you know, a lot of people, and I'm a big believer in simplicity and 80, 20 and a lot of things in life, but I just don't think doing the same lifts and all those exercises 52 weeks a year is the smartest idea. Talk about that a little bit. So if you can break down the big foundational movement patterns that you're going to do into the six, the squat, the hinge, the lunge, push, pull, and loaded carry, which is some sort of locomotion, it becomes very easy to program uh, a really intelligent structure. So that really breaks down to having 10 to 12 different patterns that you're going to be training for strength or hypertrophy in a week's time. So you use slight variations in or out of all of these. You know, you don't always have to deadlift from the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, a bottom up approach. Maybe you go top down approach with an RDL. As long as you're training the movement pattern, it's yeah. kind of all the fucking same if your goal is to be jacked, to right. be healthy long term. Right. So when you think about it like that, slight variation is key. But everyone gets really really antsy around the word variation mm. constant varied training we've all heard that before mm. and that's not something like all right we're gonna go for a fucking swim one day and then we're <laughs> gonna power lift and meet the next day yeah, that's yeah. not what i'm talking about it's about using these foundational movement patterns and using slight variations yeah so if we're gonna bench press three days a week which is what we do on some of my programs 
we're not benching with the same grip three fucking days a week on the same setup in the same rep scheme. Right. What we're doing is we're altering our ground contact positions, our hand contact positions, the way that we're loading, the tools that we're loading with. There's endless variations. And that is a more advanced technique, but I, I could see that most people do really well with two to four weeks kind of on the same training block. Okay. That's something that we use with FHT. We give people four weeks to really master the movement variations. Yeah. And then the next phase of training, it's switched up and we're gonna use a slight variation off those big six foundational movement patterns. And that's just enough for them to really enhance motor control, be able to master the movements, to get the most out of them in terms of matching mechanical responses with neuromuscular responses of peaking out weight and then being able to reset the system before they uh, actually get to the point where they plateau. Yeah, now if someone's doing the same program for four weeks, do you instruct them to kind of take it easy on week one and ramp it up as they go for four That's weeks? That's such a good question. So we do wave loading. I want everybody to feel out the program. I want them to feel out the sequencing, the timing, rest periods are a really big thing for us because we shouldn't just be sitting around for five minutes between every single set. Yeah. So I have them on the first week, I wanna make sure that we get all the reps, we stay in the same rest periods, the prescribed rest periods, and you really get a feel for the training structure. At that point, you should be able to move up in loading, especially with your strength and hypertrophy loaded set rep exercises. Okay. So you do that in week two. Week three, you're like, holy fuck, this is getting hard. And then week four, you just go out, you blow yourself out and you should really peak at that point. Yeah. You should be hitting maximal numbers, not only in absolute strength, but relative strength, like just trying to push yourself. But by the time you do that, you almost get a natural deload if you go into a new phase of training right. on week five then, because then you're back down feeling out the movements again. Yeah. Because people aren't capable of just going in and literally crushing themselves week after week, month after month, year after year. Sure. Again, injuries and burnout. Those are the two things that are really leading to really our overweight, unhealthy, just piss poor society. Yeah. So we got to think about that stuff in lining it up for success as opposed to just going balls to the wall gas foot on the gas pedal and just blowing yourself into the wall and will you so over the course of time when they're kind of wave loading step and will, will that also be a linear volume increase over time as well over the 12 weeks yeah so 12 weeks people do really really well with um so anytime that you take volume into account, you also have to take intensity into account. So on majority of my programs, I like for people to actually see objective gains. Mm -hmm. And usually the most objective thing is weight on the bar. So I want to yep. have the absolute loads increase over that 12 week period. Okay. And the volume actually comes down a bit. Okay. But we try so to So you wouldn't ramp it up and then towards the end taper back down? So we would start at higher volumes in the beginning, yep. lower intensities. Yep and then they would go inverse relationship okay. out into the 12 weeks and then we'd shift it back. Yeah. So we'd be doing by week 12, we'd have heavy ass fucking loads on the bar and yeah. we'd dial back the total volume, but also our effort would be up. So we'd be using intensity techniques, things like that. So we could really just get the most out of every single set, right. knowing that all those sets aren't there like they were in week one. And then do you, Typically, 12 weeks is, is max, and you prescribe a deload or a week off. It, or something? It's, uh, it it's person to person. You yeah. know, 80% of people are going to do really, really well on the four week blocks, uh, three, four week blocks in a program. Yeah. It's battle tested. Uh, results are king. People do well with it. So yeah. um, we go anywhere from three weeks on a block all the way up into 16 weeks. Okay. It really depends on the person. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody like Dave, like people will be seeing his training come out, but we go at about six weeks with him because we need just a little bit more of an accommodating period where he gets comfortable with some of these new movements right. that he fucking hates to right. do, but then he gets to the point where he starts performing well on them and we wanna get the very most out of that. Yeah. And every athlete's gonna be a little bit different, but I think monitoring your recoverability is really important there too because then it answers the questions for you. Yeah. You know, something like Joel Jameson's BioForce or his Morpheus, that stuff's awesome because you can actually look objectively at your recoverability and guess what? If you're not fucking recovered, you're not making gains. So you yeah. might as well not drive yourself down into the ground. Now, how many days a week average do you think most people should be training? Three to four days a week if you want to see notable results. Okay. If you're at three days a week, you go total body training and you try to get two exposures per body part or per movement pattern per week. That means that you're going to be training four to five different movements three days a week, upper and lower together, full body training. But I think there are certain advantages to go up to that four day a week 
because you can do an upper lower wait, split. Wait, hold on. Hold. Yep. Let me just make sure I got this. It's a little late in the day and I'm tired. So <laughs> <laughs> you said you can do three full body workouts, but you're only hitting something twice a week. What did I miss there? So science all points to needing two exposures yep. on movement patterns or body parts to get maximal strength and hypertrophy carryover for yeah. long, long term. So we need to be hitting at least all of those things, those six foundational movement patterns. We need two exposures over those three days. Yep. So you need to split them. And it works out to about four to five of those six movement patterns that you do in those three day periods. So you have a grand total of about 12 to 15 different exercises that you're going to do. Obviously okay. the sets and reps and the rest yeah. schemes and all that stuff's going to alter, but that's really what it breaks down to. So it, w with a full body workout, what's the kind of setup? Like, do you have uh, a heavy day, a medium day, a light day? How do you set those up? Or is it all in one day? Like start with something heavy, then pump work, or no, obviously you, you start with <laughs> pump work and then yeah. something heavier. Yeah. I, I like the days uh, to always have a key focus. Okay. So a key focus for most people is going to be one big strength indicator lift. An indicator lift lift is something that you can track over time. So you can see your performance over a long period of time to actually see if you're getting better or not. Yeah. So it's all about getting to that apex of the key strength indicator lift. So there's going to be some uh, primer work at the beginning. There might be that key indicator lift. Then it turns into your accessory volume later on. Okay. So um, really, so we maybe like if it's a pull day, you would do some kind of row, chin, and then your big lift, deadlift, and then just accessory easy like ring push-ups and split squats for, for lower body, something like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay. Um, usually on pull days, uh, a deadlift variation or a hip hinge variation is going to be the key indicator lift, and then we really just try to clean it up. That was really good that you put in that single leg, the row, and then the vertical pull. That's exactly how we do it because okay. usually we don't want to be doing like a fucking squat after we deadlift it. Yeah. So certain things fit in nicer than others, but yeah. um, three days a week, you can go fucking ham. You can get great results yeah. as long as everything else in your lifestyle is dialed in. You got mm -hmm. nutrition dialed in. You got stress down. You got everything going well with your sleep cycles. Yeah. Three days a week will do a lot for a lot of people. Yeah. But I think there are certain advantages back to going to four days a week or beyond that. Yeah. Um, and again, it's... Now, it's if someone's going four days, is it always up or lower? It doesn't have to be. I've had... I, I love uh, the movement pattern splits. Yeah. So you have a squat day and then you have a press day and then you have a pull day and then you have your fourth day being whatever your fucking weak link is. Okay. Whatever your weak link is, you double down on that day and you get a shit ton more volume there. You cover all your total volume for the week. You get all of your exposures and that's something that does really, really well. But, um, most people only can tolerate like one heavy fucking leg day a week. Yeah. Like you're a special beast if you can do two and you're a fucking crazy man if you can do three. Yeah. So really it breaks down to having two to three upper body days and then one to two lower body days. The upper lower splits tough because most people can't recover from that first leg session to get in a meaningful secondary leg session. They yeah. actually waste that workout. Mm -hmm. So if you only have four days a week, you don't want to fucking waste 25% of your workouts. Right. Yeah, totally. Especially if you're running and you're doing cardio and conditioning and For all that sure. stuff. It's, it's hard to recover yeah, as you get older. When I say four days a week, too, like you shouldn't just be doing fucking nothing, like twiddling your thumbs on the other three days. Yeah. There's always something that needs to be going on. Like daily maintenance is so important. Yeah. Like at least doing something that is going to better your physical lifestyle. Like if that's walking down on the beach or it's walking your dogs or it's going and just doing a little bit of mobility flow for five minutes. Something needs to happen every day. Yeah. Like it's easy. Everyone's got time for five, 10 minutes, very minimum user dynamic warm up again and go for a 10 minute walk. Yeah. I actually just sent out an email to some of my athletes today. I was like, guys, you got an off day coming up, but you know, off day doesn't mean off day for us. Yeah. We're actually going in, we're going to the dynamic warm up, and we're going to get a 10 minute walk. And I guarantee you, everyone's going to do that because that's a 15 minute investment of time. Right. If I said, Hey, we're going to do a two hour trek down the beach nobody's <laughs> yeah. gonna do that yeah so it's about just getting the maximal amount of return on minimal amount of investment now do you personally ever do full body workouts or not really not anymore okay. um i train alongside about 25 uh fhc elite members oh, and wow. we do uh seven days a week of training Jeez. so <laughs> wow. it's a little bit much but <laughs> again it's like my mind going like trying to orchestrate these workouts and there's brand new workouts every single day mm. so we have brand new training every single day of the week. Hmm. And it's something that we can do crazy amounts of things on the high science side and really maximize recoverability actually by training more. Hmm. Talk to me about that split a little bit. <laughs> 
So right now, uh, we alter it because, again, novelty is really, really important when the goal is to get strong, to get big, and stay healthy. Yeah. But right so now, I would assume these guys all have a training age of at least 10 years, probably? They're all hand-picked uh, members. They okay. graduated through my FHT yeah. program, and they've got to the point where they're like, holy shit, I just made the best games of my life. Like, how do I take this to the next level? Okay. That's these people. Okay. So, yeah, these people are advanced athletes. I'm the skinniest, weakest one in the whole group. Wow. Like, group of studs, men yeah. and women. Okay. We're 50-50 on that. But we're looking at two heavy days to start the week. So we do max effort days, lower body, upper body. Our lower body max effort lift is a squat. Our upper body max effort lift is a press. And then we go into lower body and upper body days, and we use it as a hypertrophy feeder session. So we actually feed volume in. We get in and out within about 45 to 50 minutes but it's a lot of sweating super joint friendly stuff super joint friendly uh really heavy pace on things uh doing things like goblet squatting that Mm. day as opposed to throwing a front squat up or something like that and we get in we get a metabolic component and we really spark recovery off of that and then the last two days of the week we do more of like a neural drive training so this is where we bring out the dynamic effort and then we also get back in and really crush recovery for our accessory work and those are usually like 60 to 75 minutes so it's like three different kind of sessions upper lower for each and then that seventh day is just true conditioning so we'll go in, we'll do intervals, we'll do running, we'll do walking, uh, we'll do mobility flows, things like that. But people are recovering crazy well by wow. training more. But again, you know, this isn't for everyone. Yeah. If, if you slept two hours last night and you just went on a bender last weekend, this program is not for you. Yeah. But if you got your nutrition dialed in, you're sleeping well, your lifestyle's on point, people are doing extraordinary things to the point where it's almost PRs every week. You know, Louis used to talk about, you know, tr- trying to hit a PR on your max effort work every week. Yeah. That shit's possible if you have all that other stuff taken care of in your life. Right. When training becomes a plus instead of a minus, that's what everyone needs to be looking after. But just because you're doing more doesn't mean you're going to get more in return. Yeah. You ever do um, a full body three days a week and then just go in and do like light accessory stuff like calves, arms, shoulder, lateral, right? Like, cause, cause the thing with full body, as, as you obviously know, is sometimes it's just compound movements and you don't get to do a ton of accessory stuff. Otherwise you're in there for three hours. <laughs> Do you ever do something like that? Well, on a day four, you'll just go in and do bias, tries, lateral raises? We have a, we have a couple of clients doing programs like that uh, where they're getting two days a week in where they're doing more of uh, isolative work. Okay. They're also doing uh, less like strength and hypertrophy work, more just pure pump work. Okay. Um, I personally don't use that kind of training just because I thrive in my lifestyle of being in the gym in a routine every single sure. day. Like I like 9 a.m. every single day being in there and actually getting meaningful work in. Yeah. And just with the way that my mind works with programming i like having like a goal for every every training session like yeah my goal for the training session was to get a bicep pump and then leave i'd be like this fucking sucks right like right. i'd be like all right so i'm gonna do I, I need like some strength indicator lift just to like get me into it and then i'll get the bicep pump later yeah so um just for my neurological makeup the way that i think uh i'm not drawn to that kind of stuff but a lot of people are they just want to get in they want to get a pump and they want to get out and again, that's that's good because again, you're getting exposures to physical exercise. As long as everything is dialed in in terms of your training ratios, you're getting what you need and not overdoing the things that are actually going to pigeonhole your results. Yeah, you just mentioned neurological makeup there a little bit. I mean, what's what's your take on that, and how much kind of weight do you put into that? Where you say, okay, this guy's a type A and is like this, so his volume has to be this, and, and this guy's you know, a more outgoing social kind of guy and this and that, like, do you get that much into it or? Um, so I, last year, 2017, uh, coach Christian Thibodeau and I, we ran a world tour. We went to Lucas gym all over the world and we ran, uh, a awesome two day seminar. Yeah. So Christian's portion of the seminar on day two was all about the neurological profiling system. It's okay. something that he's done really well with. Yeah. Um, he has an online certification and everything. So I've heard this seminar for like, Eh, maybe like 12 times. Okay. So it's something that it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And it's extremely smart stuff, especially when you're thinking about high performance athletes. Right. But um, I, I think that it comes down to having a coach's gut. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the way that's the way Chris describes it as well. It's it's like, yeah, you can do all these tests, you can do all these things. But it's like, who's the guy that is a really good people person that can read into communication patterns and they can give somebody what they're inherently drawn to? Um, that's something that is developed over time. Yeah. It's developed with authentic relationships and good communication patterns. So I think that there is something to that. But from what I've seen just you know, teaching all around the world the last couple of years is some of the best coaches that have the best theory in the world, they can't even fucking do a dumbbell row. Yeah. So we need to be putting first things first. I always say that putting yourself into a position for mechanical success, meaning that you really master biomechanical positions first, will again lead you to better neurological success. So once you master the things that are your movement patterns, dialing in the variations that fit your body and not somebody else's, then you can get really fancy and get a whole lot of out of the neurological profiling system because you got all your bases loaded and then you can go and hit the home run with the neurological profiling. But if you're you know, just bunning for singles every single time, it's not gonna bring you very, very far. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to talk about is training frequency. You mentioned that movement pattern split, uh, which I do love that as well. Now, sometimes when you're doing that, you're only, I mean, depending on how you set it up, obviously, but you can do that and only hit things directly once a week. You know, people would say, oh, well, the science shows you got to hit things at least twice a week. We know there's a million people who hit things once a week <laughs> and have success. And then if you set it up right, you're, you're going to get some overlap. Um, what's your take on, on that? Like, like, a, like a bro split or a bodybuilding split. I mean, it can work if you set it up correctly. Oh, de- yeah. oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, yeah. People are under the impression that just because a muscle is the prime mover and the concentric and eccentric, that's the only thing that counts for exposure. Yeah. But you think about something like the upper back or the back in general. Mm-hmm. So you hit it during leg day, then you hit it again during shoulder day, mm-hmm. and then you fucking hit it during back day. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're at three exposures per week. Right. And if you do the movement pattern split, boom, you're already there. Right. So you have carryover. The muscles don't only work shortening and lengthening. They yeah. have something called an isometric as well. Yeah. Uh, the trainability on the isometric component is something that is super untapped. But that's the reason that these guys are getting good results is because they're actually placing tension and muscular force through the tissues even if they're not the prime mover. They're the supporting mover, the yeah. secondary or tertiary mover, or the prime stabilizer. Uh, that's the reason why people that don't do a whole lot of direct hamstring work have fucking huge hamstrings if they're big deadlifters because mm. they support that shit every single time. Same thing with bench press, big fucking upper back because they have to support that stuff. But you wouldn't think like, oh, did you hit back today? It's like, no, I bench press. Yeah. But you're indirectly hitting back too. So I think there's a lot of carryover and that's why something like that works. But then again, that leads back to the reason that I like to sequence this stuff together yep. in order to actually synergize um, that w- what gives you the best result, not just hoping and praying that like, holy shit, I did two bench presses, that counts for two back workouts, just hoping and praying you get a result from it. Yeah. That usually doesn't work, but if you can actually call it what it is, uh, you can really put a better program together. Yeah. Now, another thing when it comes down to science and studies is you'll have uh, a camp talking about that the greatest hypertrophy gains are going to be made with, you know, 80, 85%. You're always going heavy. You're always like across the board on, on, on uh, tricep extensions. Yeah. You're doing four to six reps on everything. Yep. Uh, just doesn't seem like the smartest long-term plan. We, we call that the mythical hypertrophy rep range. Yeah. And I love guys like Brad Schoenfeld because Brad's like an old school trainer that got a fucking PhD, smart as shit and yeah. actually doing the research. Yeah. And Brad's interested in what I'm interested in, what you're interested in, yeah. is the old school science saying like, hey, why did this bro science fucking work? Right. This dude's actually proving it. Yeah. So he had a great study showing that there's really an eclectic rep range that can build muscle now. Mm-hmm. You know, anywhere from, I have a great article on my site about this, anywhere from power to strength, the hypertrophy to metabolic stress, even into fucking cardio. Yeah. You can build muscle anywhere, but you have to uh, really synergize and program it correctly. You can't just do one of these things. It really takes all of them and putting it for the individual in front of you. Not everyone's going to respond to, all right, we're going to go 8 to 15 because my textbook and physiology said that that's where muscular hypertrophy occurs. That doesn't work for everybody. And every single muscle in the body, every single movement pattern in general, they have different capabilities. Mm -hmm. They have different muscle fiber types. But on top of that, they have different primary roles. Mm. Uh, I always get in this argument with some uh, muscle physiologists about like the upper back. They're like, well, the upper back muscle fiber type between fast twitch and slow twitch, it's the same as the pec. But think about it from a practical standpoint. 
you're not doing any crazy shit with your upper back. The pec is a dynamic muscle. You throw balls with it and shit. Yeah. The upper back supports it. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you train it to do its fucking job? Right. You know, if you can train things to do the job that it's after, that's where you're going to have the biggest amount of success. Whereas the upper back would really respond to hypertrophy, metabolic stress ranges. The chest really re responds really well to power and strength. You yeah. know, it just kind of is what it is for a vast majority of people. But you can go down the body and really look at that. And if you can kind of taper your sets and reps and your goal for each exercise a little bit more strategically, yeah. you can have a better outlook uh, instead of just going, all right, I'm going to do uh, five reps on everything, five by five, five different exercises. Yeah. Those days have gone. And, that's and then even if you hurt. apply the, the fiber typing to a muscle group, you might argue, oh, I should be doing five rep tricep extensions, but it's like, bro, your elbows are gonna explode <laughs> in about three weeks. Exactly, it's yeah. the practicality. Yeah, man. it's the practicality, and it's hard. It's hard. Uh, there's so many different camps. Yeah, and trying to talk between, uh, I try to pride myself in trying to take the best information from all of the different camps with no ego and try to put together the best programs possible. Yeah, you know, I'm not just a West Side guy. I'm not just uh, a hypertrophy guy. I'm not just a sports performance guy. It's like take everything. The best shit that everyone's doing, yeah. it can all go together. Yep. And if you're not dogmatic with your approach, if you don't have an emotional relationship to your form of training, you're going to be more successful. Now, John, back to neurological typing for a second. Would you recommend that a guy who's under a ton of stress and maybe is a type A and is just always amped up and whatnot, maybe he consciously remove some CNS intensive stuff, like doesn't go as heavy all the time, doesn't do as much dynamic stuff, as much throw as Olympic lifting, more in a bodybuilding kind of rep range. Yeah, we get into this a lot in my uh, two day seminar. Okay. So we have different ki kind of people. Somebody that comes in, we can make it really simple, really parasympathetic driven, meaning like they're fucking asleep when they come in for a training session. Or you have the guy that you just described, the super sympathetically driven person, type A personality, hasn't been sleeping, drank five Red Bulls yesterday. Yeah. So you try to match Luca them. Luca Hosevar, shout out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know Luca's done a thousand push-ups and read three books during the course of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, man, he's been turning up. I, I texted him this morning, actually. I was like, dude, you've been turning up your training lately. Oh, he's yeah. like, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm like, man, your in-house physical therapist, Dan Swinsko, has really got you feeling good, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. He's really taking advantage of that. But when you think about those two different people, the sympathetic Luca and you got the super parasympathetic, you try to give them what they don't have. You try to shift their neurological input before they ever go to train. Mm. It's not good to be sympathetic. It's not good to be parasympathetic. It's good to be fucking ideal. Yeah. We want to be optimal, not one or the other. So if we can take it like that, then all of a sudden the goal for our warm-up session for the sympathetic guy is to get them on the fucking roller, do some mobility drills, and have them breathe a little bit mm. so we can bring them back down so they can actually get more out of their explosive work because that is important for an eclectic skill set. And for the parasympathetic guy, we need to actually get them off the roller. We need to give them some CNS yeah. prep so they can actually perform safely and effectively when we do get them into the power and the strength schemes and and for, for for that guy who's like luca will you consciously program a little bit differently where you don't do as much heavy work across the week or as much explosive work because you're like this guy's fried already as yeah so there's different blocks of our training um so the training day can be broken down into three different blocks for the warm-up and then five different blocks for the training session itself we'll shift up volume in certain ones we'll shift down volume in other ones so we'll try to actually match them with how they're coming in but we also have to take into account if you are a fitness professional, somebody is gonna come in differently on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not like Luca's just sympathetic all the time. Maybe he had a fucking great massage last night. Yeah. Maybe he got worked on and he's down in parasympathetic mode. Then we gotta bring him up, but you gotta be a human being, be able to look at the person in front of you, give them what they need. Yeah. So you have to have a blueprint, but you have to be able to manipulate that blueprint on the fly. That comes with experience, but it also has comes with having the fucking blueprint. And that's right. the reason I run the courses. Right. Totally. What about, um, just trying to think of a couple other topics that we haven't covered, uh, like time under tension, slow eccentric, stuff like that. Time under tension is, uh, it's key, man, especially when you're looking at staying healthy mm. and also building muscle mass into your thirties, forties and fifties. Yeah. It's something that has a really high yield because we can get great neurological response in addition to mechanical responses from the tissues and the movement patterns. So it's something that um, everyone's gonna have an ideal rhythm for each movement pattern. 
So people will be inherently drawn to cheating movements by doing them faster, but doing fast, explosive movements could be really, really good for building muscle mass. It all depends. But I think um, a lot of our sets lately, especially with our accessory work, I love throwing in sets that are like 30 to 45 seconds TUT. So not sets, not reps. We have a certain amount of bouts that we go through and we get a certain amount of time under tension with. Okay. And that's more about metabolic stress. Yeah. So if you look at like the one to three, that's power. You look at like the three to six, that's strength. You'll get the six all the way up to like 15-ish. That's hypertrophy, the mythical hypertrophy. And then you look at beyond 15, that's metabolic stress. Metabolic stress, it takes a lot of constant tension and time under tension to actually tap into. The people are like, what the fuck is metabolic stress? It's the pump. It's the nastiest skin tearing pump that you could actually elicit. Yeah. But it's not just for biceps. You know, you can do it for lower body. You can do it for upper body. You can do it with compound based lifts. And it's something that if you slow down, especially that eccentric component, there's so many different hormonal benefits that go along with it. And you're not going to jack up your joints in the process because a slower movement pattern is more controlled just because you have more time to respond to the altering positions. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, real quick. You, you, so you mentioned the metabolic stress there. And then the, the, just talk about that. We covered that a little last time. For people who don't know the kind of three drivers of hypertrophy. So <laughs> now that you know, this is a year year and a half ago, what did yeah, we say? Yeah. year and a half ago. There's different stuff that's always coming out. Yeah. But, you know, Schoenfeld, I think it was 2010, he had the big key paper on it. Yep. So you got metabolic stress being one of the key factors. So actually the pump. So you have mechanical breakdown or muscle damage of the tissues. That's like your fucking delayed onset muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. And then the last one would be the mechanical tension which would be like your heavier strength loading where actually you're getting mechanical tension through the tissues at near maximal rates. Yeah. But again, you know, you have to mix and match these things because if you try to be like, all right, so for my tricep extensions for maximal muscle hypertrophy, I got to do all three of these.